content was dwindling with Insurgency. This was two to three years after Insurgency had released, and we'd already released a tremendous amount of content for free. But at this point in time, sales kind of were winding down. And we started to see that there was not an unlimited runway, you know, with this previous game that we had released. And at some point, we're going to need to bring in more money uh, to keep the company going and to keep our projects going. And so we started to brainstorm what could we do about that. And one of the things that we actually discussed at that time, which is feedback that we actually received from a lot of people, which is that Insurgency would be great on console. We actually agreed with that. We felt that there was a space you know, in the console market for Insurgency's type of gameplay. So what we decided to do was to work on a port of Insurgency to console, not with Source Engine, because that was just not possible, but with Unreal Engine. We would be recreating the, the maps that already existed in the source version of Insurgency in Unreal as sort of a quick way to get a playable, you know, recreation of Insurgency. And then maybe it would also end up on PC as like a free update if it was like, you know, good enough to satisfy that. I can't remember the exact time, but we went through like a couple phases. At first, we're like, hey, we should make Insurgency for consoles. Oh, but won't people with the original Insurgency want to play that? Like, would it be free? Like, could we really afford that? Oh, maybe we should make more content for it. And we were like, think about vehicles, and we had these already bigger environments that we were making, and it was just so hard to not go bigger. <laughs> Scope creep is a thing, man. But we realized very quickly that trying to port all the content from the Source Engine game was about as much work as just working on something new. And out of those two options, it's just better to work on something new. And eventually we settled on basically like, well, we don't really feel like we totally finished with Insurgency and this new engine is so powerful. So yes, let's, let's put it on consoles, but yes, let's make it its own game. Let's not just make it a remake or a console release. Let's, let's do all the stuff that we couldn't do before and implement all the lessons learned and reach a whole new audience, both with PC and with consoles. We'd already like ported a bunch of assets into Unreal and we already recreated like the sort of setting from Insurgency in Unreal. And, you know, we realized that doing a proper sequel and, and keeping the scope, you know, appropriate to what Insurgency fans expect, that felt to us like something that was not just manageable, but made a lot of sense because it was also more iterative and it allowed us to evolve the whole experience even further. And we started putting a lot of our time and attention into, you know, what is Sandstorm going to be? <laughs> okay, what is Sandstorm? Is it an Insurgency remake? Is it Insurgency 2.0? Uh, what is it? The theme of our game was one that was a modern, contemporary insurgency. It wasn't like the former games where it was just an insurgency in 2006 or whatever. And so in order to do that, in order to properly represent that kind of conflict, we had to make sure that we did our research and we properly represented the setting. We got to see a lot of interesting stuff, uh, like some uh, interesting GoPro footage that you can imagine and, and photos of stuff of people who actually fought there recently, very recently. So we reached out and we, we talked to a lot of people that fought in those areas in, in Syria and in Iraq and talked to them about like, oh, what were your experiences like over there? What kind of uh, people did you meet? Well, how, how did people dress as far as uniforms go? And, and what weapons were used and, and all that kind of thing. And it was really interesting because it was more flexible than we, we thought, like, because uh, when we were doing our customization system, we thought, well, it look weird if everybody's dressed in like different camouflages and, and using different weapons and, and all this kind of thing. And there's all these different characters and voices from different places fighting together. And the answer is really no. Like the, the way that those conflicts are, the way that uh, these wars are going, is there's a lot of diversity to it as far as weapons and characters and the people participating. And everybody's just kind of thrown into the mix. And it, it, it was cool because we wanted to make a realistic game, but we also wanted to flesh things out as far as customization goes. And we had an opportunity to do that. And you know that was very interesting for us and helped uh, bridge the gap from what was different from Insurgency Standalone and Insurgency Sandstorm in a way that made sense as far as design and setting goes. 
We still want to maintain the feel of the first game. A lot of the gunplay, just the, the feeling of Insurgency is something we really tried really hard to bring over to the new game, especially with the new engine. You know, Source engine has a very particular feel, so how do you mimic that? There was a lot of time where we would just go back to Insurgency Source, play around, make a video, and then compare it with Sandstorm, like how it felt. And that's the thing, like, it's sometimes difficult to show how it feels. But th there were some things that, like the grenade throwing and like the, the way it, it arches or the, the lean, how, how far does it lean, like the free aim, like how much is the dead zone around the thing, like the recoil patterns, the way the bullet hits, how long it takes for bullets to hit. Originally, the recoil system for Insurgency was uh, very basic. It was similar to the recoil system in Dave Infamy, where it would kick the aim up a little bit. And that was about it. We overhauled the recoil system so it would have more of a punchy feel to it and it would make the weapons feel a bit more weighted. We're obviously trying to evolve uh, our feel of our weapons as much as possible. So for example in Sandstorm we implemented this hybrid ballistic system where we have this brief window where a bullet is pre-simulated. So as soon as you pull the trigger it simulates the bullet's travel for a tenth of a second. In some games which use physical bullets, sometimes hitting a target can feel delayed, but we didn't want it to feel delayed. From the player's perspective, it doesn't really matter the distance at which you're firing. It's more for feel, so it's more snappy. If you hit someone where the time of the shot wouldn't matter at all, it's just immediate and it just feels better but after you pass that range, then it actually physically simulates the round. But the bullet drop is still simulated in that little hit scan range. So it doesn't change anything. It's still physically accurate. If I fire now, you can sort of see the, the bullets. If you look up close, like you can actually see the bullet travel in real time at a distance. The little pink square represents where the game switches from hit scan to actually simulating, physically simulating the bullet. So the pink square is about the range that the bullet is uh, instant. First, we wanted to really make the first-person mechanics feel like solid and crisp, just like the original, what appealed to me as, as a gamer. As for the game modes, we knew with stats from the first game which ones were the most popular. We knew we needed a checkpoint. That was a given. That's why I joined the team was for co-op. We knew we wanted push because it was the most popular versus mode. And then we knew we wanted firefight, which was our more competitive and our more special game mode based around, you know, capture an objective, respawn your team, etc. And you only have one life. And then there was other aspects where we wanted to just grow and explore things that we couldn't do before. A big thing that we always wanted to do for the first insurgency was like a convoy mode with vehicles. So vehicles was a thing that we really wanted to try, but at the time it just technically was not going to be able to be done. We knew we wanted to try vehicles, but we also didn't really want to have them counter the already existing gameplay. We knew they would not work for Five Fight. We knew they might not work for co-op because there's eight players and only one vehicle. Uh, we knew it might work for push pretty well, but we also didn't want to give either team the advantage. So for push, we left the vehicles at the first spawn. Like, the attackers get a vehicle at the first spawn, and they go in with the vehicle and use the mounted gun, and that's really cool, and, and then they, they don't have it anymore, unless they take care of it. Like, they can actually have the vehicle, and if they protect it, take it through the entire match, but usually it gets blown up. I think it works. I think it's complementary. I like the idea of having a mounted turret that's like that just tears through walls, man. It just goes through all the walls thanks to our uh, advanced ballistics and bullet penetration. And you see the tracers in the, in the walls and going in, everybody like, hits the ground and your friend gets shot. And all, all those kind of moments is, uh, is good. I think that that was why I wanted like vehicles with mounted weapons was to like reenact the Rambo scene for Rambo, you know, the John Rambo movie, where he just gets on the douche guy and just fucking blows down everybody. We actually have an achievement in the game called JR50, which is a direct uh, homage to that. JR stands for John Rambo, and the 50 is a 50 cal. And the achievement is about getting in the back of a truck, using its own mounted gun to kill the driver, just like he does in the movie, just, <laughs> just kill the driver, because it's actually doable with the angle of the gun. Great in love with Insurgency Sandstorm, uh, one of the first things we do is get inspiration. So we go on the internet and we talk with each other, like, you know, even Google Street View. Sometimes you can find a really cool street, like, oh yeah, I want to make, want to make a level of that. We come and collect like photos and like even books, uh, movies, everything you can find, like, to, to get the resources to get started. Next step is do a paper layout. 
So you start to draw like, you know, simple ideas and, and make your sketches of what you have in mind. It doesn't have to be like finished or, you know, maybe even it changes at some point later in development. Now, after that step, you're going to start with the gray boxing, which is like a very simple, basic uh, level with only like, well, gray boxes. That's why it's called gray boxing. And one of the things I always do is I start with the center of the map because the center of the map is eventually the most important area of the map because all the players are there coming together and you know having big firefights. So I'm always trying to work on that first and then work my way out to one of the spawns. And also that way you can like check the timings and then it's a lot easier to add like uh, additional objectives. Once it is done, you're gonna start like testing it. That's really important. That's so important to start testing your map as soon as possible. When you're testing, it's important to ask like, do you like playing this? What are your best moments? What are your bad moments? It's important that you can filter what's like relevant for your design and also what stays true to your vision. Like if someone says to you like, oh yeah, I wanna like, I don't know, an elephant in the map. You're like, yeah, but you know, that's not what I'm trying to build here. It's impossible not to have something to fix, unfortunately, but that's the, the nature of our work. The characters that we make, they are usually made by parts and it works in a way that we don't have the final result right away. It's very iterative. Usually I find reference online, I discuss with my colleagues, what about this design, what about that one? I bring it to some software, I make some sketches, then I work in 3D, in ZBrush, in 3D Max, after that, I make the textures, send it to the animator, I get it sent back, gotta fix some things. <laughs> the challenge of making high quality assets with a small team basically is uh, you have to prioritize your work, like you have to find ways to do more with less. So uh, animations that are very similar but just have small differences, you can reuse them. So for every you know, minute of animation data you have, you get a lot more out of it. For all of our like poses, they're all like come from military reference. So when you see the characters standing in, in certain poses, it's all referenced from what somebody in modern military situation would do. When you see the characters using their weapons and stuff, they're not using them in a, I guess, a sloppy way. So it, it all helps to tie together what you're seeing is all like part of the experience. So it, it doesn't feel out of place. There's a lot of games that you play, first-person shooters, and they're so frenetic, they're so crazy and wild that you don't really feel like anything matters. You die and you're like, okay, well, I'll be back in a few seconds, so what does it matter? In our games, when you die, you're dead, and you gotta wait until you come back. There's loss and there's risk to that. When you wanna go to upgrade your weapon, you have a finite amount of points to do that. And everything that you do, there's an opportunity cost. Just because you're getting this one thing means you can't get this other thing. So when you create those kinds of decisions for the player to make, whether it's like in the loadout screen or when they're actually, you know, playing and they're hiding behind cover and thinking, do I move up there or there? Do I throw a smoke grenade there or there? All that uh, plays into our experience of making the, the player's life be meaningful and their actions be meaningful to the success, to winning the match or winning the round. My favorite moments in Insurgency is when you're in a room and then you hear a round just crack by your ear and then you duck but then somebody shoots through the walls because he knows you're there but he doesn't know if he got you so he just keeps shooting and emptying his mag but then he has very limited ammunition so he has to stop at some point and then you crawl away and it's like okay i don't know where he is he knows i'm here what do i do like there's so many things you can use smokes you can wait for someone you can look at the map you don't have too much ui help you just gotta kind of like figure it out with what you have and uh yeah it's it is absolutely really really tense that sort of uh, ideology of very minimalistic user feedback was there from the get-go, it was there from the inception. But everybody on the team loves that about it. And everybody I think on the team like wants to continue to do that. I think moving forward is when we'll keep making games, we'll always have that, that mindset that less is more sometimes. Providing user feedback for what they're doing can be important when it's hard to understand, but kidding someone is so binary in Sandstorm. If you see blood, chances are he's dead, and if he's not, ah, uh, you don't know. When you strip away the stuff that makes people comfortable and you force them to adapt and survive, it's all the more satisfying to survive because they accomplished something. And that's, that's a game because the HUD's minimal, like, oh, is there a guy there? I don't know. 
bang, bang, I think I got him, I'm not sure. I think I heard a scream. <laughs> maybe, maybe that means he's dead. And you go over and you find the body and you're like, okay, I got it. When you don't know what's going on and you discover what's going on and then you act and then you succeed, then you get the reward. And on top of that, the sound has to be very realistic. It has to be even scary to the point where like, oh crap, like I might die like if this happens. Because we strip away so much stuff with the HUD, people welcome <laughs> the audio. Like they don't mind all the sounds coming out and they appreciate that pretty much every gunshot that you hear in a level is somebody shooting a gun and it has its own sound signature, whether it's the distance or whether it's occluded or obstructed by, by different uh, materials or whether it's a different kind of caliber or up high or down below or indoors or outdoors. All these factors come together, so every sound you hear is information. I've actually never shot a weapon in my life before, <laughs> which is something like people might find a bit crazy. Like all of my influence comes from sort of other FPS games, um, especially like movies as well. I mean, obviously Heat like is a classic example of, of lowered sound design, like when it comes to like shootouts and, and weapon sounds. Like I don't have a unique process really, like especially for Sandstorm, what we identified was that to push the audio forwards, we had to break down everything into components. For Insurgency and Day of Infamy, like each weapon uses about three different weapon sounds. Like there's a first person sound, there's a third person sound, and there's a distance sound, and there's one asset for each of those. But for Insurgency Sandstorm, there's close to 200 assets for a single weapon. Being compared to, to DICE and, and that kind of side of things, it's it's kind of hard to comprehend personally. Like they're one of the best audio teams in the world when it comes to first person shooter sound design. And like I have like nothing but like a ton of respect for those guys there. And they really heavily influence like the work that I do personally. Like every single Battlefield game that comes out, like there's always some kind of like fresh innovation on the way that they're treating like audio, for, especially for weapons as well. They've really pushed the kind of field on, in that aspect. Yeah, I, I don't know really how to deal with being compared to it, but like I'm really, really happy that people feel like we're up to that kind of standard. Like it's, it's, a, it's a huge thing to, to hear and yeah, it makes me very happy. I gotta give credit, like most of that just came from Mark's head. I remember when he was still here in, in the other room, like I'd be working with my headset and then tap my shoulders, hey, come here. And he's just like, to put the headphones on, put the headphones on and just hit play and something awesome would happen. I'd be like, that's awesome. It was like, yeah. It's okay. And he'd just be so humble, like, I don't know how I feel about it. I'm like, just do it again. Like, I don't know. Actually, in New Year uh, 2017, he came to my house for a New Year party and Amsterdam goes crazy in here. There's fireworks everywhere. And he brought his microphone and his boomstick. And he was on the balcony <laughs> recording firework audio. And it was New Year, so we wanted to be like, hey, but he was like, shh, 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 fuck up. It's just, I, I want my firework sound. And to this day, when I hear explosions in the distance and sandstorm, I can hear the firework sound from my balcony that I know so well. I think as I started introducing the audio for like various weapons and we started playing with them in game and sort of feeling them all together, I do remember one point where um, Ming Li, like the creator of Counter Strike, like actually came to test with us one, one time and he was like, oh, the weapons sound really cool. And I think maybe that was like a point where everybody felt, well, maybe if he likes them, then they're, they're pretty good. The sound is very realistic. We have all our, our, our cracks and from the bullets and when, when stuff hits you and people scream and, and all of that, it's, it's pretty high fidelity. There was one guy who is actually a, a big fan of ours and he said he was playing recently. He called in artillery, somebody called in artillery and the, the shells that were landing on the ground, they had this very distinct sound to them that he's never heard in a game before. I think he called it a, a wet thwap just the way the shell impacts with the ground itself. And that was so intense, he started tearing up, just right then and there. And when he told me that, I felt bad. I felt like, oh geez, like we're getting these other reports of, of combat vets and uh, of, of having their symptoms triggered and getting these emotional responses. And when I told him that, he said, no dude, it's good. Like, I like feeling that way, I like that release. And it just proves that the game is as immersive as it is. That's been really interesting for us to know that we're we're hitting the audio and just the experience because it's all wrapped together in such a way that it's giving people those emotional responses, even though those are negative. 
Our game doesn't give people PTSD. Like that's the joke and everybody jokes about that. But what, what our game does do sometimes is it triggers symptoms of PTSD in combat veterans or people who have just had those traumatic experiences. That's very surprising to us and I guess kind of meaningful in a way. There's some people that say there's some therapeutic value to that. I haven't done much research and I don't know much about that, but if there is, I mean, hey, this guy's getting some kind of release out of it, right? If he's, if he's tearing up playing. We didn't really run into too many specific technical issues with Sandstorm. You know, obviously optimizing was, was a struggle with Unreal and doing the larger scale that we chose was definitely not helpful for that. There was a lot of, I guess you could say, um, disappointment that we wouldn't be able to pursue something as ambitious as we wanted to, especially when it came to storytelling and, um, and narrative. So one of the ways that we kind of, um, I guess, uh, offset that disappointment was to try to find a way to actually have story incorporated in some way into Sandstorm. We had some narrative ideas that were floating around. I've been working on a narrative and story mode with Underhell, the, the previous project that I worked on. So I've always been interested in, in narratives. It was pre-production and we were starting on some production things. We already had some of the environments for the campaign. The way we were working on the environments is we're essentially trying to scope out the story beats of where the campaign was going to take place. And we knew we wanted no field. We knew we wanted a citadel level, which actually didn't make it into the game. We knew we wanted like a town. We knew we wanted like a little farmhouse, which ended up in the game. So we, we had all these environments uh, that at the same time, we were making them for the multiplayer. So we're trying to do both at the same time. We was like, okay, here's all these locations that we intend to use in the story, but at the same time, he has to fit for the game modes that we want to make. And it was actually challenging to make a multiplayer level that would also work for a narrative. We wanted to do a lot with it. We wanted it to be co-op. We wanted to tell a very interesting story that was inspired by some of the stuff that's going on in Iraq and Syria and in these different conflict zones. And we wrote out and we talked about a bunch of stuff. We did want to tell a different kind of story, and we were excited. We were going to do a new perspective that's not really covered that much in gaming. And we thought that was very interesting, too, and that kind of upset some people. Not just from a sex perspective, but also from a race perspective, too. Uh, because, you know, people don't want to play as a brown girl. As <laughs> I know that sounds like silly to put it like that, but it's true. Like, some people really didn't like that. And of course, that's not why we didn't do it or anything. But unfortunately, just kind of with the realities of, of game development, like, we bit off more than we could chew. So 2017 comes around. We've just shipped DOI in March. And now we're around April. And we have enough of an idea for the Sandstorm story. And we're like, okay, we, we want to announce it. We want to put something out. So this idea of making a, a little bit of story teaser uh, comes about. And by the time we get it sort of approved by Focus, uh, a publisher, we're now mid-April and E3 is like a month away. And we have to give the trailer like at the beginning of June. So like we have essentially one month to put together a teaser trailer on an engine we've never worked on before. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> I put together this little teaser concept. It's like, okay, here's what we're trying to do. And essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to get familiar with the tools, get familiar with the narrative process, gauge community interest for, for the story, say like, hey, do people want this? And also try to find a process for the whole thing. So I, I put that teaser document, I put a little shitty storyboard that had like some screenshots of like angles and stuff. Uh, Michael Sarojas, Mikey, pitched in for the, uh, for the script. He was like, he had a cool idea for a little exchange between characters that fit with the story that we had in mind. And then very quickly, we just had to put all the shots together. Uh, it was a skeleton crew of I think eight people. And that was my, my first E3 trailer, kind of, put together in one month. <laughs> it's not often you get a chance to bring back the dead. But I guess we just gotta make sure we don't die though, right? Our publisher was very much like, what's going on? Like, where is everything? And we had some pressure to put something out. This is what our team, you know, felt like we could do, you know, for E3. And in hindsight, you know, that obviously was a mistake. Like, we should have done something a bit more multiplayer focused. 
there was already, I think, a little bit of like uncertainty around the story around that time, but it wasn't formally put off at that point. It was, it was well received, a uh, lot of views on a lot of different channels. You could say that they were more interested in like the multiplayer aspect of the game. Some people did show interest for the story, but you could feel that they were afraid that if we put too much emphasis on the story, that we would neglect the multiplayer. We wanted to move on to a new engine. We wanted to establish ourselves in a physical studio or multiple physical studios. We wanted to create an all out story mode that was gonna feel like it was very compelling from a narrative perspective. And we wanted to do adversarial multiplayer and we wanted to do cooperative multiplayer. And we wanted to do competitive multiplayer. And you see where I'm going with this, right? It was just too much shit. None of us were professional writers. All of us thought you know, that we were really good at what we were doing. I think that our story was like, okay. It wasn't maybe fantastic. By working on the story a lot, we were taking our focus away from the things that we felt our core audience was gonna care the most about. And we had to kind of be realistic at some point. We had to say, look, like this is, this is a cool, compelling thing, but what are our strengths? And what are we passionate about? What do players want? We realized like, no, it's, it's just not the time for this, as excited as we were. And also admittedly, like it was a bit of a sensitive subject. Those conflicts aren't over, right? That are going on in those areas. And we thought like, oh, well, it's not necessarily about those areas. Like we're just taking them as inspiration, but like what kind of story are we trying to tell? How much inspiration are we taking? And who are these characters? Is it gonna feel relatable if we do that? There were just a lot of questions there, but the main thing was just the production. It just wasn't realistic. We put our community announcement, decided to delay the campaign. We're gonna give people what they've been asking, uh, focus on the multiplayer on PC and deliver that. And then we'll focus on consoles and then maybe we'll read the story later. And yeah, when we released that, people were like, oh, they canceled the story. It was like, no, no, wait, later. But all the titles, the headlines were like canceled. And I was like, okay. We still have some, some ideas in the back of our minds for the story, so it's not fully canceled. Like, I don't know, who knows? It was kind of cool to release that trailer, even though there was a bit of uncertainty around it. But it also, you know, sort of reminded us in the end, like, you know, when it actually came out and we actually saw the feedback on it and stuff, like, you know, we're, we are sort of like amateurs at this, you know, and um, maybe we're in a little bit over our heads with this. I remember the first time we showed Insurgency Sandstorm at uh, T3, uh, the queues for people playing the game were absolutely massive. We had a really good spot at the front of the Focus home booth. And I remember at one point the uh, venue security came around and had to break up the queue because it was going so long that it was blocking the fire lanes and fire exits. We were completely shocked by the huge amount of pre-orders we got at E3. I believe we came close to a quarter of a million copies of a game before the game was even out. I don't think we were that concerned. You know, we were monitoring the marketplace and we didn't see any games that are really comparable to, to Sandstorm. You, know, you have plenty of games out there that are really good, some of which are modern setting and things like that, but none have the specific scale and the specific balance between realism and gameplay. We knew going into the release of this game that not only was there a place for our game in this crowded market, but Insurgency fans would also be very happy. Internally, we set an aggressive deadline for, I think it was the summer 2018, for like June 2018. We didn't tell anyone because we knew that was probably not gonna hit it, but it, it kept us focused on, on a date. And as it got closer, we actually weren't too far off. So we set ourselves a deadline that we announced to the community, which was September 2018. We made it to that date and we hit the closed beta. And uh, people, I think, realized that the game wasn't ready and needed to be in the oven a little longer. I mean, we could have released it in September, but that would have been a bad move, I think. So I think it was a good move to move it back. Frankly, we had a bit of a, a tough beta period. We put the game out and you could pre-order it and you could play in the beta for Sandstorm. And we got a lot of honest, good feedback about how the game was not running well and how there were other mechanics and imbalanced things that were just not playing very well. People were even saying like, this doesn't feel like insurgency. That was tough for us to hear, but that was legitimate feedback and we acted on it. We optimized the game, we improved performance, we balanced the game, we made the tweaks that we needed to do. We improved the UI to make things clearer and made a tutorial level and, and all these different things. And then to release and see the ratings were as good as they were, 
that was really meaningful and that was great to, to see all that positive response. It was pretty well received. I think we got an 80% pilot reviews on Steam, a 79 Metacritic score. We hit the top seller on Steam, number one, after a few hours and we've been there like consistently for about a full week. And then the weeks after that, we've been in the top 20 and we're still there in January 2019. Uh, I think it went pretty well. We made a good game, is what it looks like. Sandstorm's launch has been incredible. I think we had like four times the amount of success that we had from Insurgency's launch. From a financial standpoint, we made way more money. From a player count standpoint, I think we peaked at 8,000 players concurrent at launch and Insurgency's launch peaked at 2,500. I think the biggest mistake about the launch of Sandstorm maybe was the timing or at least that I think hurt us the most because the holidays were right after that and the team had been working extremely hard up until the release and it became really difficult for us to quickly like patch out a lot of the issues. We did a, a patch like two weeks after the release where we fixed like the majority of the major issues but there were still a lot of like medium and smaller issues that, that remained. And then our team was on vacation and some people were still on vacation, like when we got back and they had requested that time, you know, a long time in advance. We were kind of shorthanded on the production side in January. And the result of that was sort of a less than ideal post-release patching. Even though, yes, we let the game kind of be released and, and you know, be in a slightly buggy place for a bit longer than maybe we should have. We know that we're going to fix those issues. We know we're going to optimize the game more. We know we're going to add a lot of great new content and weapons. And we know that the game's going to go on sale a lot this year. And a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't have tried it are going to give it a try. So I think we have like the, the formula there to, you know, to keep people coming back and to, you know, to build the game up a lot from here. When you're making a game especially a first-person shooter with a very large scope. You have to be thinking two, three, even five years in advance. The game you start concepting and creating now won't be playable by fans until several years later. So it's not just about following the trend and making a game that is popular because that's what everyone's doing now. You need to really think several steps ahead and make sure you're continuing to innovate and push the genre and do something unique and different that people have never experienced before because that's the best way to sell games. Every project we've had as a team, even before me, like Insurgency, Modern Infantry Combat, The Mod, which released 2007, then Insurgency Standalone 2014, Day of Infamy, the World War II shooter, in 2016, we've only been growing. So I think my proudest accomplishment, our proudest accomplishment is probably Sandstorm because we really, <laughs> we really did a lot with that game. Whenever we put out an update and just see people, they just, they love the game. They wanna just keep playing and they like that we just threw a couple new things in there. And you know, why do we do what we do? We wanna put fun into other people's lives. We're not doctors, right? We're not first responders. We're not uh, saving lives, but we're putting fun into other people's lives. And, and I think that's something to be proud of. So any time when a community member said to me, hey, this was really awesome, or said to us, or left a good comment, uh, I think that that really shows you that you're doing something nice and you're doing something right. You know, I, I think about that time before early access insurgency, where we were about to run out of money, um, the company was about to go out of business, you know, there wasn't a very clear sense that we were going to be successful. You know, at that time, those of us that remained on the team, like we persevered through that and we put everything that we had into that game and overcoming the challenges that were thrown at us. Overcoming that and eventually releasing Insurgency to the success that, that it had for where we had come from was you know, truly meaningful to us. And then Sandstorm was kind of similar in the sense that we had different problems, different size team, different ambitions. Like this game was double the price of what Insurgency was. So the expectations were double as a result. We didn't execute Sandstorm in sort of a perfect way, I guess you could say. It was a little bit rough in how we underwent development for Sandstorm. We certainly did have to crunch a bit towards the end. And I think that Sandstorm in those last few months leading up to the release was extremely challenging for our team. 
And I think that some people on our team like, you know, may have almost lost their minds, you know, <laughs> like in that sort of stage of the development. You know, the fact that we were able to overcome that in the end and get this game out the door and that we got the front page takeover on Steam and that we got so much initial positive feedback and uh, sales success. That was, to me, was also very awe-inspiring. The feeling is hard to describe. It's very, um, it's very inspiring and very, uh, very rewarding, um, even when it's not pretty. I remember through, through all of this, struggling with how what we did, and in particular how Jeremy wanted to do things, defied business rules. There are business rules. They may not be written down in a book, but there are certain ways you do certain things. And funny thing is, I, I had this weird uh, epiphany one day that, you know, it was four or five years in, and we'd arrived. Whatever arrived means. We'd sold a bunch of games. We had money. We had a great company. People were calling us. And I said, we did that despite breaking the rules. Like, really basic traditional things. Like, this is how you pay people. This is how you make deals. This is what has to be in contracts. You know, things like, all the things I'd done for many, many years. And I decided, I'm going to write a book called The Making of a 50-something Millennial. How breaking all the rules actually works. I haven't written it, but I do think back on what the feeling was to recognize that. And for my own personal growth and development, I would say it was a reinforcement that being righteous is wrong. And, you know, I got to thank Jeremy to a big extent because, you know, he has given me some insight into, yeah, you know, there are some different ways you can do things. I think the hardest thing for a traditional business guy, finance guy to deal with in our industry is that you can say when you're going to have it done, it doesn't matter. You can forecast when you're going to launch, it doesn't matter. You can say how many people are going to buy it, it doesn't matter. It's all guesswork. Because when we say we're going to launch even an update in three months, you don't know that something you're going to do is going to break your ability to update. Now everybody's trying to fix what you broke. And that requires something that most business people can't stomach. And that is dealing with the unknown. Launching games is luck. It's a crescendo of activities that people don't really comprehend. It's an art, it's a science, and it's a miracle. So the future for New World, it's looking optimistic. Uh, it's looking pretty good. We're opening an office in Calgary, in Canada. We're trying to centralize more of our team on site. That's been a struggle for us, just because of the nature of our team being from all over the world. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of people on site in Calgary. I don't know what the number's going to be. It really depends on how our appetite continues, and I think it will grow. We're not going to build a campaign with 400 people. Damn, I want to build a campaign. But I will not be surprised if we get to 50 or 60 on-site people in Calgary. Denver will remain. That's the plan. And Amsterdam will, will slowly be migrated away from. I'm excited that we are growing, that Sandstorm has done well, and that there's so many new people in our audience that are going to want to play not just Insurgency Sandstorm, but that like, like our experience and want to check out our future games too. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just very happy with the way the game has gone and the future, there's a lot of opportunities, I guess, you know, because we've established ourselves and there's a lot of room to grow. Now we're experienced with Unreal Engine. Now we got our FPS platform that's pretty solid. Uh, we got our processes earned out. We got a little bit of a structure that's manageable because we're managing it. And we are in so much better place now than we were just last year or two years ago. Whatever we do moving forward, uh, we'll spend more time doing than tinkering. It's kind of this, this, this thing where you're building the bridge as you're on the bridge, kind of. And yeah, now we've finally had time to pause, plan, and think ahead. I mean, we'll always tinker a little bit because we're modders, I guess. That's what we do, but we'll spend more time doing than tinkering. Essentially what our focus is for 2019, we're working on 
making Sandstorm even better. As you know from our history with Insurgency, like that, the release is not the end for us. With Sandstorm, we're gonna be you know, adding new maps, adding mod support, adding more weapons, fixing issues, improving quality of life, adding retention features. And then on top of that, we have the console version of Sandstorm, which we're also working on. We're also hoping to get a um, sort of a patch out for Day of Infamy uh, to, to leave the game in a slightly better place because we're not thrilled with the state that it's currently in. We left you know, some bugs in there that are problematic and the only reason why we haven't been able to get to it is just because you know, Sandstorm has just completely absorbed you know, our time and energy. We are going to make a new shooter. Like, we know that this is an area that we excel. For our next shooter, though, we're actually in the process now of having our team pitch ideas and actually vote on ideas as well. So we're going to try a bit of a different approach um, than we have in the past. So I can't say specifically how we're going to innovate or, or what we're going to do that's exciting uh, on the shooter front. But what I can say is that we are going to continue to excel in the areas that players expect from us. And we are going to be doing something that our team is very excited about. Um, and that we feel that the community will also be very excited about. And I'm sure there'll be more information that we share in the future. Looking back at like how I ended up here to begin with, I think it all begins back in childhood with what I would refer to as an obsession with games. And then when I discovered modding and you know tools to to modify video games like it was almost like this epiphany that I had when I was young back then it was kind of about this sort of unknown of like what can games become and also the fact that as modders we could actually be pioneers in forging that path as well the experience that I had with modding sort of enabled me in my own mind to, to pursue creating a game company more seriously so if I didn't have that modding experience there's no way I would have had the confidence to start a game company at that point in my life. So modding led me to the creation of New World. And the creation of New World led to the commercialization of Insurgency, the opening of our office in Amsterdam, meeting my wife. It led to where I am today, sitting here.